That's kind of on CV, yes? You go to it. So Catherine is a, Catherine Olsen in school is a mechanical engineer here at the SAO. And she received her MSc in engineering at UCT in 2011. And then worked at the South African Nuclear Energy Corporation as a structural analyst before astronomy called her, which I think was a good move for astronomy. In 2015, she joined the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory as a project engineer and structural analyst. And in 2019, she kept up the spectrum to optical astronomy at SAO. And she is responsible for instrument design and providing engineering support for maintenance of apparatus. And she says that she has very little idea of what astronomy is, but she definitely knows that they have really nice toys to play with, which I guess she really enjoys doing. <laughs> and she will tell us about the toys tonight. So over to you, Catherine. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you very much. Um, I suppose I have to reiterate. So whenever I, I do a sort of semi-public talk and I, I say, look, I, I really have very little idea of what astronomers do with the data. Um, inevitably, people ask me astronomy questions at the end. So um, if you do, I will defer them to some actual astronomers. In the world. Um, OK, so I don't need to introduce myself. Uh, Christian has done it. Um, thank you very much, Christian. Um, and hi to everyone else here. So I thought that I would take this opportunity um, to, hang on, I just want to get my screen. Yes. Yes, OK. Um, so I thought I would take the opportunity to this group tonight um, to tell you about the, the sort of current telescopes and instruments we have on the plateau in Sutherland and, and where we're going. Um, so, so what's currently available and what we'd like to do with it in future. So just a sort of snapshot of where we are. Um, and yeah, and, and what's coming. So what we have in Sutherland, um, a chunk of it is on the Intelligence Observatory project. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it before, um, but it's a really exciting thing. So I will reintroduce that and then I'll just give the latest updates on two of the key projects that are contributing to that at the moment. And then every so often, I'm just going to sneak in a pretty picture that one of our, um, our instruments have, um, well, made using the instruments that we have on site. And you can see in the bottom corner, the instruments and the telescope. So our division, the instrumentation division at SAO, um, we are made up of a number of instrument scientists, uh, each of them having uh, some kind of specialty. So it's transients, it's fiber, um, we've got a fiber lab, we've got a couple of postdocs in those areas. Uh, we've got electronics uh, capabilities, mechanical capabilities, software we poach astronomers or, you know, from other projects. Um, and then we've got a, a workshop which um, has six six operators and um, their manager. And we, we're really quite proud of that one. We, you know, our, our general philosophy is that we try and do as much in-house as possible, as much of the design, as much as the, of the manufacturing and assembly of instrumentation in-house as possible. And that way you you can sort of develop and retain the expertise to support these things on the Sutherland sites. Um, if something goes wrong, the guy who designed it has to go fix it. Um, uh, yeah, our facilities, we've got our electronics lab, uh, CCD lab, where we sort of uh, build the symbol cryostats, detectors, and an optical lab for sort of bigger optical assemblies. Fiber Lab, which is a fairly new thing. Um, they do a lot of research and development on how to make uh, fiber assemblies that are appropriate for astronomical instrumentation. They've done some pretty cool things. I really wanted to share some of that with you tonight, but it just got far too long. So I encourage this group to invite Sobisachi to give a talk. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, the, the workshop, which I went and snack a photo of this, this evening. Uh, I've lost count of the number of CNC machines in there, um, but they do some phenomenal things at the moment. I think we, we can get a repeatability um, on machining of about five micron or so, which is a thousandth of a millimeter. They are getting a new horizontal machining center in the next week or so. Um, so they've been very busy up until now, but now there's a lull while they try and find space for a new machine in here somehow. <laughs> Except the workshop, 
That is the workshop right here. Yeah. Um, so it has right at the back, uh, sort of right at the back, there are still some of the uh, conventional machines with, you know, the three axis manual machines, but uh, it's really, really become a, a sort of CNC machining center in the last decade or so. Okay, uh, I give a variation of this talk to the general public and I never quite know who I'm talking to. So just some terminology that I use. Um, the word telescope to me means the thing that collects the light and delivers it somewhere useful, right? <laughs> the, um, the instrument is what we've replaced eyeballs with. Um, so it takes, the, it takes the useful light and it does something with it and it delivers it to a detector, right? Um, common instruments we have in Sutherland are imaging, Images, they make images, and uh, spectrographs. Uh, I've got a polarimeter or two as well. Um, our detectors, the detector is a lot, the last thing a photon sees before it becomes an electron. Um, and that is true for retina. It's not true for photographic plates, which I have an example of in the back, but it is also true for your um, photo multiplier tube technology. Uh, photon hits there, uh, charges increase, red ups, through the electro electrodes at the back here. And, uh, and it is also true for your charge coupled devices, which are the most common astronomical detectors in use today. We use, this is a very small one, uh, um, which I can pass around to you just now. This is a very small one. We use a much larger version in our instruments that we are developing today, uh, sort of camera about uh, 90 by 90 um, sort of flat silicon surface. And then of course, there's the, the CMOS devices that are used in your uh, cell phone cameras. Those are much faster, but not as sensitive as CCDs yet. Um, and in astronomy, we're in a photon starved environment. So we want as much sensitivity as possible. Uh, let's see, which is this picture? So yeah, as I said, imagers make images. And to get a pretty one like this, you have to take quite a few frames um, with different filters in the beam, and then you combine them later and apply liberal doses of artistry to, to get things that are magazine ready. Um, generally for science, they stick to the, the sort of monochrome grayscale versions, which we'll see a bit later. Somewhere in a WhatsApp, I have the names of all of these objects, but you can't ask me right now. <laughs> a, a few of them will be M83 because that's our um, favorite first lights object on a, on a new instrument. So spectrographs, uh, they make rainbows. Uh, you can employ uh, various devices to do this. Uh, back of a CD or a DVD works quite well as a grating uh, and um, prisms prisms, combinations of prisms and gratings. Um, so there are a few different ways um, you can get that. And this is just a, a, a photo of one of the gratings on our Sputnik spectrograph, um, just because it's pretty. The output of a spectrograph is a bit more boring than the images. Um, you get, <laughs> okay, read my audience. Um, you get new, you feed it a sliver of light, and that sliver of light is broken up into its spectral components. And if you take a cross section through your um, what lands on your detector, you can get a plot of intensity versus wavelength. And using that, as you know, you can tell things about uh, chemical makeup, motion. Um, yeah. Okay, so. If you look at the picture at the bottom, which was taken by my recently ex-colleague, Billy Gwertz, who is on this call, um, you will see that it's quite busy on the plateau in Sutherland. And even though this photo is only a few years old, it's out of gate already because there's already one, two, three, four, unless I'm missing one, there's four new domes with telescopes inside um, on the plateau. But uh, I will stick to the three that South Africa wholly owns and operates. So of all those on the plateau, um, yeah, we, we wholly own and operate three. The others like SALT um, are a joint venture in which South Africa is a major shareholder um, and the rest are hosted facilities that we operate or well, we, we host and maintain on behalf of other institutions. Okay, so my favorite one, we'll start there. Um, got the 1.9 meter, 74 inch, still going strong. Uh, it is the one that was moved down from Pretoria from the Radcliffe Observatory 
has uh, that equatorial um, mount, right? the sort of classic one axis is pointing towards the South Celestial Pole. And uh, it's got its 1.9 meter primary mirror hiding down in the cell here. Uh, it, we operate instruments on its Cassegrain port. So light comes down, bounces up to the secondary, down through the primary mirror and to whatever we mount down at the Cassegrain port here. I always like to include a picture of the nameplate. It says 1938, which I like to think is the year that the nameplate was made. For those of you who know, the uh, telescope itself was only finalized and commissioned after the Second World War um, was finished uh, because they had to bury the mirror at some point to protect it during the war. Um, that is a fascinating story on its own, which I was going to hear. So yes, 1938 is the year the nameplate was made. Um, and then the instruments we can put on there. So, so we, we stick instruments down on the Cassegrain port. So that we have three instruments uh, in rotation on that port at the moment. It is Sputnik, which is a spectrograph, and it's pretty big. It's about 170 kilos of instrument, I think. Um, we have Hippo, which is a polarimeter. And uh, it also takes light down, you know, delivered at this port up in the telescope, delivers light and splits it to two detectors, which are actually your photomultiplier tubes. And um, this one's quite sensitive. When it's amplifiers on, we're not allowed to switch on the, the lights in the dome, um, just because the signal will be far too strong and it will destroy this. And then we have, it's hard to see, it's a tiny little camera um, called Shock Sutherland High Speed Optical Camera. And um, a couple other things I'll just point out at this stage, um, the telescope always needs its, its sort of enabling systems as well. So that includes guiding. Um, so here we have a guiding system that in its job is to just make sure the telescope is tracking your targets at all times, um, especially for something like a, um, a spectrographic uh, sort of objects where you might be doing a 20 minutes exposure or something like that. You don't want your, your, your object to just drift off screen. Um, and then, you know, shock requires its filter boxes to, you know, populated filters to stick in the beam. And then there's some optics in here that, uh, you know, either send the light off to guiding and acquisition or send it off to the primary science instrument. So I just wanted to point that out now. We'll come back to that. So those are the three instruments we use on that. And the way it works currently and has for decades um, is that an observer will submit an observing request um, to a committee for a particular telescope instrument configuration. And, the, observe, and the, the committee will consider that proposal against all the others and assign an observer a particular block of observing time. So typically one week at a time, and you can get multiples of weeks or weeks at different times of the, of the season. But in that week, that is your chance, that, that is your telescope time. So you go there, historically, you travel up to Sutherland, you do your science and you leave and you hope you don't get clouded out um, because that is your week. Um, on Wednesday's instrument change day, on a Wednesday, you take a look at who's observing for the next week and you make sure that that instrument is on the telescope. It is a manually intensive process to change instruments, especially these heavy guys like Scott, Nick and Hippo. So there's special jigging tools. It's a multi-hour process. Sputnik is cooled by liquid nitrogen, so you have to sort of pump and cool. And you know, it's um, that is what Wednesday days are for. And then you still have your one instrument on the telescope for a week. Come back to that later. Okay, moving on to the one meter or the 40 inch. Uh, it is also the, an equatorial mount telescope. Um, I, I must sort of apologize. Uh, Whenever I look through my pictures to, to try and pick ones out for a talk, I realize I don't actually have very many promo shots or pretty shots of telescopes. They're all working shots. So often the best I can do, say for, for Hippo, is uh, half an instrument and two technicians, and that is the best shot I, I have of the entire thing. So you'll, you'll see a few just slightly useful photos. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, yeah, the Elizabeth Telescope or Thomas the Tank Telescope. Um, equatorial mount, also one meter primary mirror, also uses the Cassegrain port. So light comes in, bounces off the secondary up here all the way through. And if you look closely, yes, that is cardboard on the back there. I'm not even going to go into that. <laughs> so that was a particular test we were doing at the time. Uh, it's got a slightly more honest nameplate. 
And uh, the only instrument we are currently operating on there at the moment is a little shock camera, again, with its acquisition optics, guiding system, and filter box. There is a plan um, for the 40 inch to mount a survey instrument in the next year or two that has been developed by some collaborators um, at Ayuka in India. Um, but that's that's still in development and we don't quite have the timeline on when that is coming. So that will be a survey that's conducted over the course of a year or so. Yes. How thick is the one, one mirror? How, how thick is the mirror? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Um, with corresponding scale for the 1.9. <laughs> I, I don't know exactly off the top of my head. Um, I'm sure one of the guys on the who, who are remotely on this call might uh, might have the value. And then um, and then we have one of the newer ones. So Lacedi is also a one meter telescope. Um, so it's got a one meter primary mirror, but because it is an alt as mount telescope, it is much much more compact than the other one meter telescope. And we can do that obviously the advantage of the Equatorial mount, as you all know, is that you don't, to track an object, you only have to rotate about one axis. Here, you have to rotate about two to track an object, but we have the computational power to do that, so it is not an issue, and it is much more cost-effective to build telescopes like this space. The city has two ports that we use, so we don't use the Cassegrain port, we use the two Naismith ports. So she has primary mirror, bounces up to the secondary, and then in the middle, hits a Fold mirror, 45 degree fold mirror, we need to rotate that way or that way, sending light off to that port or that port. So we can have an instrument on each port. And this is the first of the small steerable telescopes which aren't constrained to just one instrument on the telescope. And so you can, yeah, you can select with just a sort of push of a button in the software. Uh, on the series one port, uh, we have the wide field imager called Sibonise. Uh, Sibonise is, um, uses one of those very large uh, CCD chips that I uh, told you about. I've got a picture of it in the slide or two. For Sibonise, everything was designed and manufactured and assembled in-house in our facilities over here, barring the CCD itself, which we buy in, and its controller, which is a different kettle of electronic push. Um, but everything you see here, uh, including filter mechanisms, grippers, um, and you know, sort of cable handling. Everything you see here was developed here, assembled here. So just some shots of inside. You see the back of the CCD here, this dark thing. Um, I think this is Billy's arm. And uh, yeah, this was during a, this was either during a chip change or during a bit of troubleshooting that we had to open up here. There's a lot of copper on the back to keep it, you know, cool. Um, that's how we get get the heat out. Here is this chip I was talking about. We have to develop a cryostat package around it, which gets the the data out on these cables out of a sort of vacuum environment into the outside world. Uh, got the data. Got to get the data out. Got to get the heat out. Got to prevent other heat from getting in. So it's a lovely design challenge. Um, and keep moisture out and keep like sort of statically protected. It's it's wonderful. So we, we stick the CCD inside the, the cryostat and this is the window which uh, coincides with the port on the telescope. So light comes in there, hits the CCD. There's a better shot of the back of that. Got some heaters just to regulate temperature as well. And then on the overall instrument, the cryostat is hiding somewhere in the middle here of all this cabling. Got a cryogenic cooler, some filters, and its controller. This is the team that assembled it. Uh, we're recognizable. We've got Egan, Peter, and Billy. Um, no sooner had they sent the WhatsApp to say that it was done and assembled and on, um, lockdown hit. So they sent the WhatsApp, shut it down, switched it off, and drove home for the next few months. <laughs> If you try really hard, you can do that. On the other port on Lacerdi, we have uh, an instrument called McCordy. Uh, McCordy was not designed by us. It was designed in um, uh, collaboration with LJMU at Liverpool. 
Um, but COVID necessitated that we assemble it and install it. So we still retain that sort of in-house knowledge. McCordy is pretty special. She is a spectrograph and imager in one. And I'll go into why and how that is achieved. So the actual instrument body is hiding this black, sort of black box over here. We've got the telescope port on this far side through the body of the instrument. And there is a detector on the back, which is an off the shelf and or camera. Uh, power supplies, enabling systems, filter, filter slides, um, all contribute to sort of her operation. But if we open up this box, on the left, you have where the telescope delivers light. So it comes in. And if you just want imaging, then the light comes in, goes through some corrector optics, unencumbered, unencumbered, and goes through the back to hit the detector. Right? Uh, there's filters mounted in here that you can slide in and out of the beam. Photo of populated filter slides, and uh, she can do that. If you want a spectrograph, I don't have a photo, but in a spectrograph configuration, but there are two components here. It's a slit, slit mask on a pneumatic cylinder. So you psh the slit in the, into the beam, you psh the prism into the beam, and out the back here, you get a spectrum on the detector. And that is a raw image of what that looks like. Uh, and then you take a cross section of that. Um, this was an early spectrum that we got out. We'll come back to, to her later. Okay. So um, at this point, I need to oh, I see our Zoom. Our Zoom panel is, is covering that, but that's his intelligence observatory up there. So at this point, I need to jump over to the intelligence observatory and describe a bit about that project for those of you who haven't heard about it. Um, so in contrast to something like the Meerkat radio telescope, which was designed from scratch to be remotely operable, um, the telescopes in Sutherland are all unique. They have a unique set of instruments. And up until, you know, a decade or two ago, something like the 74 inch didn't know what the internet was. So you went there, you had to travel to the telescope for your week, you sit in the warm room, you conduct your observations, and then, um, you, you know, you, that that's the only opportunity you had to get your data. And as I said earlier, you hope you don't get rained out. So the Intelligent Observatory has a pretty ambitious goal. That project has the vision of taking all the telescopes and instruments in Sutherland and making them first remotely operable, which most of them are. So you can operate from anywhere. They respond to software commands. And, um, and sort of plowing, collecting all these into, feeding them into a central observatory control system. And the job of the central observatory control system is to take this sort of one cohesive suite of telescopes and instruments and, um, and optimize what observations are done. So how this might work for a regular observation is that an observer will submit a request to the observatory control system of the OCS. And uh, the OCS will work out what the optimal instrument or telescope or the requested instrument is, slots it into the queue, and the queue is executed that night. And this is done automatically. So the advantage of this is that um, you can much more efficiently use telescope time. So if an observer only wants 16 hours on a particular object, they don't need to take up a whole week. They can get uh, four hours this night, four hours another week, um, you know, and other science can be done in the middle. Um, yeah, so you, you move away from this regime of having one observer per week, you do maximum 52 observation sort of blocks a year, and you can go into something where you can service hundreds of thousands of observation blocks a year um, just by picking the appropriate telescopes and instruments for that observation. What it also allows you to do, which is pretty cool, is um, rapid follow-up of interesting transient events. So say an alert comes through for a new transient object, so a supernova or an asteroid or a comet, something like that, um, the OCS can determine which of the suite of instruments is available to observe that that night, and it can slot it into the queue. So to operate these things sort of unmanned or robotically, the IRO project team has to think about quite a lot in the grand scheme of things. They have to have the hardware and the software to support um, 
monitoring the weather, monitoring whether there's rain so the domes can close. Um, they have to have cloud sensors to make sure they're not pointing directly through cloud and object. They have to um, know that the object is in focus. I mean, normally you have an observer who can say, oh, my first frame is junk. I better reconfigure my instrument. So it's got to know whether it's in focus. It's got to know whether it is looking at the correct object. So there's a lot to be solved in a hardware and software sense um, for this. Uh, yeah, and and in a in the physical sense, the the older telescopes just weren't built for this kind of operation. Um, so, you know, you saw in the the seventy four inch at best, it's at best it's two ports per telescope. Um, so it's a lot, and it is early days, but we are actually doing it. Um, so the next few slides, I will give you an update on those projects. So. Talking about the 70 inch and 74 inch, so from a hardware point of view, that you know, the, the question was asked, well, can we increase the number of instruments on the telescope? Now we have these three instruments, and two of them are big ones. So just to remind you, Sputnik, big, Hippo, big, and Shuck, really tiny. Yeah, big. Um, with enabling optics. So ask the question, well, given that Shuck is so small and it is an imager, and images are kind of useful. Is it not possible to take shock and its filter box and just kind of move it up here with the rest of the, the, the guiding system and acquisition system? Why can't we do that? Um, then you free up all this real estate down here for one of the big instruments, Sputnik or Hippo. So that's what they did. Um, the basic premise of the instrument selector is that uh, in that black acquisition box, you essentially insert a, a fold mirror. When the mirror is in beam, it diverts light through a guiding system, through a filter box, onto a shock camera. And when it is out of beam, that light goes down to whichever big instrument is mounted below. And what follows is some gratuitous shots of all of this in sort of during assembly. So this is a uh, part of the new guider prior to spray painting it black because we don't like shiny things in an instrument. <laughs> um, new repackaged filter units using our old existing filter mechanism and the flip mirror in question. This is also just pneumatically controlled in or out. So mirror in, shock, mirror out, big instrument. And this whole package is migratable between Sputnik and Hippo. So at the moment they have commissioned it on Sputnik. Um, so you can see the flip mirror in there, uh, open guider box, I think this is one with the guider box closed, filter unit on, and then shock actually mounts at the back. This is just a shot from the laser alignment. Again, I have no promo shots, so you will have to believe me when I say that as of the 15th of March this year, um, for the first time, we now have two instruments selectable on the 74 inch at the push of a button. So the next step is to do this on Hippo, um, for Hippo. And um, yeah, it's it moves the number of instrument changes from about 40 a year to about six a year. Um, and there's always an imager available. So physically, that, that's what's physically been done on the 74 inch, but there's a lot of software work to now incorporate it into some grand scheduling um, sort of protocol. But let me show you what it looks like when you do have something incorporated into a grand scheduling protocol. So, um, this is one example of what can be done. Um, I'll just take you through the, the sort of workflow. Um, there are many other types of science that people do using this um, exact method, but I will I will talk about transients. So we are back to McCordy. Um, advantage of Lacedi, the Lacedi telescope is, you know, she's modern, she already responds, you know, she's readily integrated into a software environment. So this made, you know, it made sense for this to be the first one where this was this was done. And McCordy, as you will recall, is either a spectrograph or an imager, also a Um oh, this is just a fun image. Um, we'll start with a transient name server. We'll start our workflow with a transient name server. This is a sky map of every single transient alert that was created since 2016. So comets, asteroids, supernova, things that go bump in the night. There aren't fewer of them in the Southern Hemisphere. There's just fewer detectors and surveys in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, Atlas, which we have a telescope on site, um, one of the Atlas, uh, I think one of four, 
uh, is the purple dots, and you can see they cover quite a large, um, large bit of the southern hemisphere. So my colleague Nick has uh, has written a script to poll the transient name server every fifteen minutes, and has parameters so you can you can interact with this. There's an API, so he's just got something running which does this every fifteen minutes. It says, "Give me every alert within the last day." Um, he'll put in some declination limits to, you know, within Lacedi's observable sort of declinations. Give me everything from Atlas in the last day that is unclassified and is uh, greater than magnitude 17. So that's within McCordy's range. And maybe sometimes it'll go two weeks with nothing, sometimes it'll be two in two days. Um, so on average, about once a week, he gets an email alert. Runs the scripts on the inbox. So this is this is all happening with no human intervention, right? The script which pulls the TNS sends an email. There's another script which takes these email alerts and submits it to the observatory control system. Whoops. So our object is called AT2024 EYO. So it's called our object. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it was automatically submitted by the IO robot to the uh, observatory control system. So this is a list of all the submitted observation requests and their status. So my colleague wakes up in the morning, says, oh, look, an alert. It was submitted. It was observed. It has been completed. And about a third of the way down his cup of coffee, he goes and he checks the logs for that day. He says, OK, here is my object. The spectrum is file number 44. Let's see what it picked up. And at this point, I'm going to be very ambitious and try and retrieve that result live. So, um, because I think it's very cool. It's number 44, file number 44. And let me just, just confirm the guys on Zoom. Can you see the web browser? Yes. Thank you. Thanks. So from that log, uh, I know that that observation was on the 25th. Uh, uh, we said it was file number 44. I know that that's probably around there. And let's see what we get. And here is your spectrum with reduced spectrum. So here is your raw, here is your sky, here is the sky subtracted from the raw data. So this is your resulting spectrum. And uh, the astronomers in my life tell me this is pretty um, pretty sort of indicative of a type something something supernova. Um, so that was picked up and reduced with no manual intervention. Um, and you can have a look at the acquisition images as well, which they take automatically in support of a spectrographic uh, observation. So it's just the raw detector image. Um, of the spectrum, and then with the slit out, you turn McCordy into an imager, and you just take an image of the field as well to see your bug, which I thought was pretty nifty. Now let's see if I can get this. The spectrum, this may, if you scroll up a little bit, look at the spectrum on the towards the, the shorter wave length, um, at the bottom one. Mm -hmm. I just want to see what is that scale. The bottom of the draw, that one. So it's a wavelength on that side. And is that absorbent or intensity? Or what is that? You see, I told you someone would ask me an astronomy question. No, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Can anyone else? Yes. There's flux on So there's flux on the, the y axis. Um, yeah, I'm trying to find out because there's a lot of energy or absorbance on the left hand side. I'm trying to figure it out what's happening in the UV section. Right. Um, is that the optics yeah. or is it the limit of the optical system? That is a good question. I don't actually know. Um, there are obviously sort of at the at the extremes of your wave band, there are uh, instrumental or systematic um, limitations. Yeah, limitations. I don't actually know. Um, on the on our sort of wiki, um, I think we we said McCordy is best between what four hundred and eight hundred nanometers. Okay, so we are um, below that so we, 
Okay, now let's see if I can, yeah, there we go. Okay, so, so that was the results. Um, no manual intervention, which we think is pretty cool. So McCordy is actually running fully um, uh, automatically scheduled at the moment. Observers submit their requests to the OCS. They do not get the telescope for a week at a time. They just submit the science they want the and they come and collect their data once it has been, once that observation has been done. Um, and then we've also got these things listening for transient alerts, it's like that. There's another spectrum, it's just another super new series. This is a composite image. Uh, this is the JWST uh, oh, yeah. image wow. of that section, which was. Why does it color seem so much different? Green, I thought it was green. Remember that liberal amount of artistry that you have to do to uh, produce color images? Yeah. Different interpretations of the the filter, the filter sort of contributions of the different colors. Uh, I want to ask you if you agree with me, what's making it impressive. But... <laughs> uh, people also people always sort of get quite offended, you know. That those who you know they, they get quite offended when I say that you know um, the pretty ones are are. are Recombined, they're created by a person. Yeah. Um, as a consolation prize, your eyes do the same thing. <laughs> you have, uh, you know, different senses at different wavelengths, and your brain just does the recombination. So it's the same process. <laughs> um, okay, so I thought I would just end off with some, some candid shots of what we do here. Um, I have lots of photos of, yeah, uh, Billy and Egan. Uh, that was installing Sibonise. Uh, Nuts and bolts wrangling, mounting instruments, uh, laser alignment. I believe toothpicks were involved in this. So sometimes we need a precision solution to a problem that presents itself on the day. Um, you, you use what works, man. <laughs> um, sometimes we suspend 170 kilogram instruments uh, from, from chains and hope for the best. Um, that was a brave hand underneath there. Uh, cardboard engineering, second time this is re-edited. Sometimes that's what you got to do. Uh, this is actually salt. This is the RSS instrument on salt, but I, I like this photo of the precision adjusters um, installed on the side here as you lower it through the floor. And uh, most of you just have a bunch of fun, really. Uh, that's, uh, that's me. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, Billy is on to things. Six inches sick. And watch this video. Go to Billy's YouTube YouTube channel. I, I meant to I meant to say that multiple times throughout my talk. <laughs> Thanks for the <laughs> Are there any questions from anybody? Oh, another one. Um, is there a limit of how many mirrors you can? In between your light source and your machine, because a bus for the normal telescope is got at least two mirrors, right? The, the primary and then the secondary, and then you have a flip mirror, or we have a diagonal, this is probably the same thing, mm -hmm. and then you might have another one because it must go to the assessment. And to the, the, yep. Does those mirrors not absorb light and degrade the quality of the, of the photons that you can? Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know about uh, in terms of a limit, but when we do an optical design, so when we design an instrument, part of the analysis is a throughput analysis. So if you, like in the case of the instrument selector, um, we knew the components, the optical components, we would get those all off the shelf, they're from Saw Labs. So we knew the throughput of those or the, the loss associated with those, and you do an analysis all through your optical path. See, given 100 photons, how many are you gonna be left with? And is that scientifically acceptable? Um, and then you can either optimize your design based on simplicity or throughput or, you know, whatever you, you, you make your, your design choices. But yeah, there, there, are, there are some with a fair amount. Um, the, yeah. Yes, yes, it's the- so You don't want to use too many birds because of the grade. You want to maximize throughput while achieving what the instruments are supposed to achieve. Um, and if you can't design it um, to result in a throughput that is acceptable to the science community, then 
then are you build are you building the right instrument? With your automated observatory, where where do you actually get a human involved? Are the results interpreted by intelligence, artificial intelligence, or does a human look at the adventure? Right. So the question is, uh, with the the intelligence observatory, where 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 do we put in the the meat bag intelligence? <laughs> so humans still submit their own observation requests. So if we have students doing particular science, doing particular projects that want particular objects, um, they will compile all their observations and their observation parameters. So you need, as the scientist, as the PI, you need to sit down and say, okay, I want to observe the subject these coordinates, um, I want uh, an image with these filters, I want this uh, length exposure, I want, so you need to compile all your observation parameters before you can submit it to the system. But assuming you have defined your observation completely and correctly, uh, the system will just execute it and you can fetch your data for, for further analysis the, at the end. So that, that quick look sort of spectrum reduction I showed you is really just, it it's by no means meant to replace the scientific analysis that you are after in your particular project. It's just meant as a, a quick look. So the final, the final analysis done by human. Yes, and and so the 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 observations that are conducted are are conducted for humans because those humans want the data. Um, so yeah, they will just come. It just means that you don't have someone sitting in cloud in Sutherland, hoping they'll get their data. We can just give them their data a lot more efficiently now with this. Are there any plans for, say, one stage further analysis to be done by artificial intelligence yet? Oh, it depends who you ask. Absolutely, if you ask some people. <laughs> and, um, but I, I don't think you're ever really going to get away from, I mean, people just, people do this because they like it, right? Yeah. Um, so. So I think you will have a range of users, some of which will use artificial intelligence. We already know there is more there is more astronomical data existing on Earth than humans could ever reasonably process. Um, so there are projects um, for machine learning algorithms and AI to kind of remine those and see if they can pick up anything interesting. And especially these really large sort of High data throughput projects um, like Meerkat, like the radio sort of stuff. Are there any, sorry, are there any plans that the final analysis, the artificial intelligence will then say, therefore, this means the following? I do not comment. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure some people will um, will will take it there. Uh, but uh, no, that's not the plan at the moment. The plan at the moment is to have a very efficient observatory at this current. <laughs> I think it all depends on the algorithm um, that is being being used by the artificial intelligence. So yeah. We feed the artificial intelligence to judge what's going on. Or the set of training data. I think it was being used for, for identifying um, maybe galaxies yeah. on a large scale where they've used a lot of human input for the learning stage. Um, yeah. And then from there, the algorithm is developed and refined to do the finding of the actual galaxies yes. and classifying. Yes. So there's definitely room and space for it. Yeah. But it's still, I think the major input is still from humankind to teach what at this stage, call. yes. At this stage. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm actually glad that you mentioned that uh, we have coaches. Uh, I sent Cal and then created that actually. Um, I, I sometimes uh, scroll on the Google Plus and all those. Uh, Examples, and I read that sometime recently there was a collaboration between South Africa and the team was spearheaded by a doctor that was by a doctor but not Australia. They were looking using their color to look for um, galaxy gas or something like that in our in the art discovery for in digital galaxies. I was like, what? <laughs> it was that. I was I was quite I was quite very nervous because I'm like yeah the 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 wonderful thing about these sort of you know 
well, any instrument bill really is. It's but especially these really large ones which require lots of political willpower and the, you know, the, like JWST and like Mecha, is that inevitably someone says, why? Why are you building this? Why are you spending that money? And there's always the list of reasons that people have that they can use in presentations to say why we're building it. But actually the most exciting things are the serendipitous discoveries. The You know that this thing is going to be so good that it's going to see something you never imagined it would see. Um, and you can't even say what that will be until you see it. Um, that's the that's the cool part of all of these. Like JWST, when they were trying to commission, they were trying to look for a dark patch of sky, and they could not find one because it is so sensitive that there's galaxies everywhere. Uh, actually, actually, when I put that, people say dark patch, like actually, it's only dark patch between, I think, a couple of million galaxies. Yeah. And one side, there's actually this whole time, and in that specific uh, place for, I think, I couldn't remember really that time, but when the information came through, it's it actually full with the information. Like everyone had done it was like, okay, shit, you know, I'm sorry, like you can like you felt like I couldn't yeah. like it. Um, and also when you take the um, uh, the telescope and uh, from compared to the previous one, I can't remember what is that was it was now I think it was four or it was more. Um, the, they they did the same images. And the kind of grading, because the technology and the hardware that we do, the JW, whatever that is, we can, um, I saw the original images like 10, like, like 10 years ago, and I just want the refined ones now. I was like, holy shit, this is how it actually looks like up there. And we, and once the technology progresses, we are going to become better and better. So, I mean, yeah. it's actually amazing what's going on up there. Push the boundaries of your yeah, yeah your, your imaging capabilities. So I think you know what the intelligent observatory um, say would it allow say multiple observations like multiple telescopes looking at the same object. So say with salt would be looking at an object with RSS and the same following up as an optical at the same time. I don't see why not. Um, so we we have something uh, outside of the IO project. We obviously have something similar going on at the moment with the the Mir Licht telescope. And the job of Mir Licht on our site is to just be an optical secondary to whatever Mir Cat is looking at. Um, so it points wherever Mir Cat's pointing. If there's something interesting in the optical that Mir Cat picks up in radio, at least we have the data. So you know the the sort of the the real drive these days is for that multi-wavelength data to exist for you know so you, you want you want data in over the whole spectrum um so it's a it's a great application for us um quite interesting yeah. you could have like five telescopes looking at the same object that right. keep giving us a different view right being able to see a different wavelength wavelengths for it once yes yes um, obviously there's, there's a lot of limitations um, on Earth to having an infrared telescope. That's why JWST is where it is, and that's why that's been built. Um, my question is do you have any near infrared, or do you actually also struggle with, with heat sources to be able to make use of near infrared? There are a few telescopes and instruments on the sites which are specifically designed for near infrared. Um, SALT actually has, is, is busy commissioning um, a, an NIR. The instrument is called the NIR instrument. Um, that uses, uh, it doesn't use silicon detectors, it uses, it uses other materials that are more sensitive to infrared energy, uh, to convert those to electrons. <laughs> and um, so I think the prime telescope is also specifically geared towards uh, uh, has has an infrared uh, camera on it. But I am I, I'm not as au fait with with those instruments. But yes, there are there are certain telescopes on the side which are particularly geared towards that, and they'll have uh, their instruments will be um, optimized. There'll be different materials. They'll be, um, but none that we've built in house as yet. Maybe the Chinese infrared telescope. Uh, we have Prime, which is Japanese, which is one of the new ones. It's one of the ones that's missing from from these images. Um, I think uh, IRSF, possibly, and NIR and SALT. As I said, now we're we're treading the limits of my <laughs> my familiarity. Yeah. Any of your first time students, this might be some of the things you see a lot 
Um, do any of them benefit much of my life needs or whatever from, from outside coming in? So, so if that's the case, I say you get gamma rays from the sun or whatever. Does that in any way mess up with the image set by that? All right, so there, is, there are a few ways to answer that. Uh, yes and yes and yes. Um, <laughs> so the question is uh, what the effect of sort of the environment, the heat, yeah. solar environments on your on your data, basically. Um, yes, we get cosmic rays on, uh, on our detectors. They show up as little blips. I wonder if I have an example somewhere. Um, which we mostly try and... Um, the Photoshop them out, or uh, or they're not part of the science, you know, sort of. It's like hot pixels. And yeah, they look green and all kinds of. Well, it's, a... well, it's not a. It, it'll be grayscale. Yeah, yeah. It's a biometric, and it will be all colors. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think I have one which specifically shows. We've got some wonderful, wonderful images, even even dark or biased images, which are taken with the shutter closed. Um, I think we actually we we determined that something we'd coated one of our shutters with had a, a fair amount of energy or activity to it as well, um, and that was just increasing the cosmic the, the cosmic counts um, on our on our image. Um, but uh, and then in terms of of heat, um, yeah, I mean you very definitely want optimum conditions in your dome. So for that reason, something like salt has louvers um, where. You know the outside and the inside air can mix and so there isn't that thermal gradient which results in that shimmery thermal seeing um the other telescopes you want to open up a little while before you do your observations just so they can um also uh, equilibrate um and then the, the the dome construction itself is is sort of you know if you look at a dome it's especially these uh let's see go right to the end here um uh, right. Um, you you see this sort of this construction where you have these two permanent louvers um, or shields on the outside. Those are all there to keep the inside as cold as possible during the day. So you can go inside a dome, it's 35 degrees outside, you still need a jacket. Um, and the idea is that when you open up at night, um, there's less of a again less of a gradient but you still want to give it that chance to um yeah to get into equilibrium and you will still notice if you start observing too soon you will still notice that the focus of your telescope changes at, you know as the as the air cools um so you've got to something you've got to watch out for as a competent observer the, on the telescope that gets more like very up high or very low I don't know if you remember those optical tube assemblies are just long steel assemblies and steel loves to change shape uh, when when the temperature changes. So your whole tube is basically breathing with temperature. Um, and it's something we have to consider in even the, the de design of our cryostats. Yeah. You know, as the temperature changes, the materials that you've used will will change dimension to a certain extent. So if you don't want your CCD shifting around in there or stresses on it, you need to come up with some nifty ways of compensating for that. Um, okay. Also, the, 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 I read recently um, about the domes and different paints that will radiate the heat away. Yes. So I've actually read that some of the shiny domes it's terrible at that. You know, if you have a certain aluminium surface, you actually want to get rid of it. I can imagine. And it was yeah. dissipate, so black body. Yes. It's actually better. <laughs> yeah. But it's terrible during the day, but it's ideal at night. Yeah. To, radiate heat away from the dome. Yeah. White dome is beautiful, but it's actually not very good. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I haven't looked into it, but I, yeah, I can absolutely. Uh, there's something you mentioned earlier. If you have two uh, different telescopes in the same object, like one, but you have two different forms of information. How uh, uh, do you combine information why does the new picture you need to get this information coming in from the same point of view? Okay, so the question is, yeah, how do you how do you uh, process information coming in, same object but different wavelengths, yes. difference, you know? Yes. Um, I wish I had an image. Um, there's a lovely image out there of, of some sort of you know famous object which which overlays the optical 
the infrared, the gamma rays, the radio. Um, it, it overlays all of those, and you can switch the layers on and off. And please go Google it. Um, it's a, and um, and you can actually see. I mean, in radio, you can see um, just the extended area of emission of this object whereas an optical you can you know sort of maybe see a tiny fraction of yeah. things that is something that is radiating physical visible light. um it's just a it's it's up to the science it's up to the human at this stage uh, to bring those different forms of data together in a way that makes sense um for, for that but there are some lovely um uh, visualizations on the internet to, to go and have a look at that